Hey there, Dan with VGM Academy here. Um, I wanted to, first of all, uh, thank you for checking out this video. This is an amazing inside look at the monthly members Q&As with industry experts that we do every month inside of the VGM Academy Members Network. Um, now, this we're going to share uh, publicly uh, to give kind of a sneak peek, but it's an hour-long Zoom call with an industry expert. In this case, we're, um, we had uh, DJ Cutman, a.k.a. Chris Davidson, join us, which was an amazing hour-long chat. Now, what's nice about these, these chats is that I get to get out of the way, and members get to ask their questions directly to the guest and get answers in real time. Um, it's a great way for them to get those answers quickly um, and ask follow-up questions as well as uh, get to know the guests a little bit and vice versa. So it's a really amazing opportunity um, for composers who are looking to break into the field. And um, this was just an amazing chat with Chris who shared his wisdom on, you know, licensing music, making money with music, being motivated, being, uh, you know, productive and consistent, things like that. Um, he's also, I mean, if you've not heard of his his work, you're probably living under a little bit of a VGM Academy or VGM uh, rock. So come out and t check out DJ Cutman. Um, and uh, he's the at his handles at VGM, uh, sorry, at video game DJ on most social media. Um, and he also runs a record label called Game Chops, which they just are uh, finishing up a, an amazing Kickstarter campaign uh, around uh, Zelda and Chill 2. So I'm going to put the link in the video description for that as well. But if you enjoy this video, please feel free to try VGM Academy Members Network for free. Um, we have a month-long trial. You can jump in there. You can watch this. You can catch this recording. You can download it. You can also go back and binge watch all the past ones and join December's live Q&A coming up later this month. Hope you enjoy the video, and I'm sure you'll learn something because there's a lot of great stuff in here. Without further ado, here is Chris and the members of the VGM Academy Members Network. Here they come. Well, hey, everybody. Hello, 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 folks. That was really exciting. All the videos like. I know. This is, this is this is a lot of fun. Every time is a lot of fun. I'm really excited to have Chris, a.k.a. DJ Cutman here with us hello, tonight. Everyone. So um, thanks, Chris, so much before we even get started. Thank you so much for spending some time with us tonight and digging in deep with some conversation, hopefully, and answering some questions and I'm really excited to like shut up and get out of the way so other people can ask you some really great questions and you can um, share your wisdom. I, I hope I can. I hope I can. Uh, this will be an enlightening evening. Yeah. If nothing else, you know, if we really run into a dry spot in the conversation, you can give us some armor tips because I was just telling him before. Sure. Yeah. I can just put it on and DJ. I have my mixer right here, actually. So we could, if, if it gets dull and we need to just play, play some bangers for a while or some lo-fi, just let me know and I'll jump on it. Love it. I'm I'm like li almost every day listening to the uh, the the radio DJ Cutman. Uh, oh, Radio Cutman, yeah. Radio Cutman, yeah. On YouTube, Dude, I am. Um, like... That that station has been totally dwarfed by Video Game Study Lounge on the Game Chops channel. But Radio Cutman was my very first stream that I set up, and it's like there's some gold. There's some really formative beats in that in that stream. So yeah, yeah. thanks for listening. I, I found the the Music Lounge first, but then mm -hmm. I I kept getting distracted by the chat. Which is like yeah. hilarious. Yeah, dude, the chat is wild, <laughs> and they're good kids too. They're, I, I think they're almost all like, uh, they're well, all like grade school kids, and they're yep. doing their homework, and they're being good, and they're mostly being friendly to each other. And I also needed like twenty mods to keep it that way. So, yeah, but yeah, fun time. So uh, let's get to the questions. Is there anyone anyone out there who's got a question, something I can help with? Yeah. I know that Kirill had a few questions queued up ahead of time. So Kirill, oh, yeah, uh, Frederick, you both have questions. You, and Ziad, you, both, you all had questions. Don't be shy. Now's your moment. Um, okay. Hi, Chris. Hi. Um, how you doing? <laughs> um, so I, I also, I love DJing as well for years and years, but I kind of stopped for a little while. But I, 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 I totally can appreciate that big time. J like uh, DJ Jungle for many years on vinyls. Oh, the dude, that's awesome! I love drum and bass. I actually, I had a habit of dropping drum and bass in like almost every set for a while, even when it wasn't like the best decision. <laughs> I just really love that type of music. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't been DJing this year. Clearly, I don't think many of us have. But uh, yeah, well, well, what's your question? What can I help you with? Um, well, my my first question, kind of, uh, when you when you get the um, when you do the remix, right, you have to get some kind of licensing or permission from the artists. I mean, if you want to use it, obviously, for commercial purposes, if it's 
non-commercial then i think it's that is the number one question i get a hundred percent of the time is how do you do the video game music on spotify and And um i have condensed it down to like a very small uh answer um you go on a distributor like DistroKid or sound drop and you get a cover song license when you upload the song and it used to be a big old process but nowadays it's super easy DistroKid charges a dollar per month uh sound drop takes a percentage um of the royalties that come in to cover the fee of filing for the cover song. And then every month when royalties and stuff come in, it automatically gets sent to like the rights holder. So say for example, I was going to do a cover of uh, Michael Jackson, do a cover of Thriller. Uh, That would be a project. Just thinking about that. Um, I produce it and I can go on DistroKid and I can upload it and I can type in Thriller and I can upload my master. It's all, if it's all originally created. And there's just a little checkbox that say, this is a cover song and I'll put the original songwriter michael jackson the name of the song thriller and then when i upload the song before it goes out to like spotify and itunes and everywhere um they will get the cover song what's called a mechanical license which allows me to use the composition of the song um and then uh manage it and like maintain it for the lifetime of the song so like the game chops catalog all those video game songs you hear on spotify they or itunes or apple music sorry i'm just such a spotify junkie it's open right now in my doc um, but on any, on any, on any music platform, uh, is licensed and automatically whoever it is, who's running the show, DistroKid or SoundDrop, every month they are paying more licenses to the right holders, whether it's Michael Jackson or Koji Kondo or whoever. Um, mm-hmm. and then what's left over, they're giving out to the artists. So like, that's the basic thing. That was a long answer, which, but it's basically use SoundDrop or DistroKid and get a cover song license. Right. Okay. Too long version. Yeah. Okay, because I thought you you know you you you're still going through pain of like finding a an a, a, an um, an artist who is like not necessarily even producing anymore, for example, you know, but because of the copyrights, it's like and you can't yeah. Do anything. So there there is some ground rules that help. Um, in the United States, um, the song has to be published in the United States to be um, to get a compulsory license, which is something that actually was pretty cool. The government did back in I think the seventies. Um, saying any song published in the United States, you can have a cover song, you can do a cover song of it, anyone can, um, as long as they pay this, there is a word for it, this rate, it's got a fancy word, but I'm blanking on it. Okay. But you pay this rate, which is about nine cents on the dollar, and you can cover any song that's ever been published in the United States. But so there's limitations to that too, like for example, um, you wanted to remix, uh, man, it's gotten a lot better in the past few years. But when I started, for example, I did a Metroid album, uh, called Chozo Legacy. It was a 10 track mega uh, Metroid album uh, by the artist Blind. And um, really cool progressive house and, and dark uh, uh, deep house. And cool. it was, it's a really cool album. Four of the tracks we tried to license, um, but they had never been published um, in a soundtrack form. And it, it was the only takedown that we've gotten in the Game Jobs history because um, we tried to clear all the Metroid songs thinking there was um, but we can only do the ones that had been published on a CD. Nowadays, uh, Nintendo has put out a lot of collector's edition soundtrack. Um, Smash Brothers, there is a Metroid one now. And so it's really, really easy to find it. Like almost any video game song you can think of um, that has a CD release in the United States and you're able to clear it. So nowadays it's really, really easy. But back in, I think 2013 when they did the album, the Metroid game for 3DS hadn't come out and the soundtrack had not either. So a couple of the more obscure tracks, like the one in that really deep level where there's like the fire water, I forget the name of it. Um, but we did a remix of that, that was not published on the soundtrack and therefore we could not get the rights to it. But uh, yeah, sorry, this was such a long answer and I've never really been able to bottle it down. But uh, basically, yes, there's a great website called Video Game Database, a uh, VGMDB. And if .net, and if you don't know this site here, uh, I wish I was a Zoom pro and I could show you guys my screen, but it's vgmdb.net. I'll put it in the chat. And that is an incredible site that has basically every game soundtrack that's ever been out. And it is a wonderful reference to see what has been published and what's available for a compulsory license um, from DistroKid, SoundDrop, or, in, or another way to get licenses, which is the old school way. Hey, there it is. Yes. So that's the site, VGMDB. If you're looking to clear cover songs, this is the site where you search um, to see if the song, either the source of the song or um, the original soundtrack has been released. 
And um, if you find it on this site and it looks like it's a real CD um, that's been published and like put it out someplace, you can go to DistroKid or SoundDrop and almost certainly get a license. Or uh, there's another one. If you want to like, uh, say you want to do vinyl, like Game Chops is doing some vinyl right now. Um, and to do that, we need to get our licenses up front. And I knew this was going to be a licensing call. I just knew it. I, I was telling my wife, I was like, we're going to talk about licensing for the whole hour. Um, but you guys care about this stuff, right? So it's, it's good info. It's hard learned info. So easysonglicensing.com is an awesome team of 10 people who uh, can clear these compulsory or mechanical licenses for whatever you're doing. So separate from DistroKid and SoundDrop. So when we produce our like Zelda and Shell 2 finals, which we are currently crowdfunding on Bandcamp, I will also drop a link in the chat. Um, we had to pay for those licenses up front. We had to pay for 250 licenses for Bandcamp to even put the put the crowdfunding thing up. So, and we were able to do that with easy cover song licensing. We find the albums on Video Game Music Database, uh, communicate with the fine people who work over there and um, pay them the fees for the licenses themselves and for them to do the work. And they give me like PDF documents that prove that we have the rights to the music. And then that's what I said to Bandcamp and um, yeah, that basically says, hey, you have rights to sell it. And then what's going to happen is this Zelda and Chill 2 album um, performing very, very well. I'm so super grateful. Sorry to gush a little bit, but this like completely exploded beyond what we had imagined. We were aiming, we were aiming for $5,000. We needed to sell 250 copies and we have pre-ordered almost 1,200 copies, over 1,200 copies of which is essentially our like first or second self-produced record. And um, the way we're able to do that legally is getting those licenses from Easy Song Licensing. And then once this is done and everybody's pledged who wants the album, we'll have a final count of how many sold. And I go back to Easy Cover Song and I say, hey, in those 250 licenses, we also need another thousand or however many. And um, I'll pay them the fees, they give me the documents, and that's how we keep it all on the level and make sure all the composers and the rights holders are getting their um, they're due royalties for the for the use of the compositions. That's that's cool. I think that's uh, that was uh, full enough to answer. I appreciate it. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's that's the whole. That's the, dude. I I've had so many so many panels at cons that the first twenty minutes was exactly that, and I just like I don't know how to boil it down. I want you guys to have all the info. I think that you just boiled down probably years of stuff into about 10 minutes. So I think that that's probably pretty cool. But that, you know, I think we're minutes. good with it. There you go, yeah. guys. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so I see Steven's got a hand up. Steven, you want to uh, jump in? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Chris, for that rock solid introduction. Hell yeah. I'm curious, with so many hats that you wear, what does day-to-day -day work look like for you? Like when you wake up in the mornings and you're like, oh, I'm going to do some work today. What does that look like? And then also if you can give like a pre-post COVID. So like, how is this changing in real time since we've been sort of quarantined for nine months? Yo, uh, the ironic thing is not much. It has not really changed that much. Um, the world has certainly changed uh, and I don't get brunch anymore, but sort of that my daily routine is pretty much the same. I'm going to give you guys the ideal routine that I would like every day to look like, but realistically it doesn't. Um, wake up, um, go to the coffee, which my wife has usually already made and I'm so important, so important. Uh, go to the coffee and practice piano for about 20 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour. So first thing in the morning, ideally is don't look at the phone. Don't look at the notifications get the coffee, like wake up the body, go and practice piano. I'm taking piano lessons with a teacher over Zoom and she's giving me pieces every week to work on. So I'm working on these like kind of middle school level piano pieces. I'm not a piano player. Originally, I am. Uh, I played sax in high school and, uh, but like I'm a computer musician. So, um, but I practice piano basically to just stay offline for the first half an hour of my day. Then I hop onto the computer and if there's nothing like no pressing client needs a deliverable right away, I go into responding to messages. So email, Twitter, Discord, usually those are the big three. Um, so half an hour piano, go and boot it up, see who needs me first thing in the morning. Um, or uh, if I have mixes that came in that night, I listen to them while my brain is fresh and give notes to the producers. 
Um, there's a lot of that actually in like running game chops. A lot of my time, like the hours I put into the label are listening to work in progress tracks and giving like creative feedback. Um, usually technical mixed stuff, sometimes structural stuff. But um, so I would say maybe an hour of, maybe 45 minutes to an hour of responding to things. And then uh, now it's 10, 30, 11. And that's usually when I start my first um, production block, whether it's uh, mastering an album like Zelda until two, doing mix downs for an artist like Megaran, um, working on my own album, DJ Cutman volume five might actually come out this year, which would be awesome. Um, so, and I, then I produce for about two hours, um, working on whatever project is, break for lunch, usually about a half an hour, um, try not to eat in front of the computer. I used to work an office job and I always did that. And when I, when I started working for myself, I was like boundaries, no food in, on the keyboard. So I try not to sit in front of the computer and actually take half an hour unplugged. Then I go into another longer production box, usually three or four hours where I'm either working back and forth with the producer. It's a really great time. Like one to four o'clock on the East coast is a really great time to basically the whole world's awake. I don't work with a whole lot of folks in Asia, but, um, Folks in Europe aren't awake, folks in California are awake. So that one to 4 p.m. is really when it's like collab time where either I'm working on something, but most likely I'm going back and forth with people, um, giving mixed feedback, planning ideas, sending stems back and forth. I'm working with Mega Ran on his uh, Black Materia remake. And there's a lot of just managing assets and sending assets back and forth. And those usually happen in the afternoon. Um, then at about four o'clock, I try to, I shut off my discord. I try to go dark on my notifications. And from like four to seven, I work on something that is not immediately needed, like something more creative, uh, either a song for myself or a project that um, does not have a deadline yet. Um, basically in the evening, I'm working on like more free creative stuff. And so basically first thing in the morning, the studying, then the people, a block of, work like production work and then try to do at the end of the day even if it's just a half an hour an hour of making a beat looking through gear like unplugging stuff and trying things um just to remind me like why i'm doing this you know and um and then that's pretty much it you know sometimes i'll do some emails or some metadata stuff on the couch afterwards but but yeah that's basically the framework that i i really think my best days are built like that I was going to say, you started that off by saying, ideally, is there a realistically that sort of- Oh my God, yes. Out? Are you kidding? Like, <laughs> dude, the week before Zelda and Chill 2 came out was the most stressful week in my life because the licenses for some reason got delayed like five weeks. And usually it takes like a week, maybe two. Oh no, like 10 days or 20 days. That's like kind of crazy. But we've been waiting for almost an entire, over a month, and the album and we had announced it like so early on because we shipped six weeks in advance and we announced it because like of course it'll be ready but like wednesday of the album release where we posted all these trailers and everybody's hype chopping at the bit michael the producer like hadn't produced anything in almost an entire year so his whole like his whole career is riding on this album and the the dot on distro kid is still yellow that night, I like didn't sleep at all. I just like laid awake, like trying to visualize the yellow dot turning green, like being like, what am I going to do if this doesn't come out? We can't even push it back because it's like stuck in this limbo of like licensing and not shipped out yet. And, uh, and I got up at like, I think it was like six, five thirty, six in the morning, which is early for me. And um, that's usually when the cat gets me up, actually. So Tango woke me up, got a feed Tango. I can't get back into bed because I've just been like lying awake, like stressed out about the, the cover song licenses. Um, and so I go to the computer and I, f I go into the, I break my routine and I go into the studio and I open up the laptop and <coughs> turn it on and reload Distro Kid and it's green. And it was just like the most relief that like 25 pixels had ever given me in my entire life. That's so finally like, yes, yes. So uh, leading up to that, when that thing was yellow, I like couldn't get into piano mode and I couldn't do like fun producer mode at the end of the day. I was like too cramped in. So I was just, you know, there was a lot to do with that album. Not only does it have 14 songs, um, it had a full length music video. It had a bunch of promo and rollout stuff. Uh, it had a Spotify ad campaign. It had all this stuff on the back end. So um, in the non-ideal days, I'm too stressed out to do the good stuff at the beginning and the end. And I just like, crank it through tasks until I pass out. It's not a really good, it happens. It's not a really good, uh, it's not a good thing to happen all the time. 
Yeah, well, thank you for that honesty. I appreciate yeah, for it. sure. Also, before we just leave this behind, just to clarify, Tango is that that's a Mega Man reference, if I'm not yes. mistaken. Yes, can you believe it? And we adopted him, and he already had that name. But that's yeah, I think it's in Mega Man Five. Destiny. That's what that Tango, is. Mega Man. Yeah. He's a great cat. He's in Mega Man Five by Doctor Light. Yep, Mega Man Five. Go. Beautiful. He's yep, a good I'm boy. A, I'm a huge Mega Man fan myself. So yes, clearly. There's I don't know if you can see how many cut men I have all over the studio, but there's a lot of them. This, I one, bet. this one's the coolest, I think. Nice. All right, Frederick, you're up, my friend. Hi, Chris. Thanks for doing this. Really appreciate it. Um, I watched uh, one of your talks, uh, Business of Making Music, uh, oh, recently. Yeah. Really, really informative. So thanks for that. Yes, thanks uh, for watching. No, um, one of the things you spoke about was the importance of releasing something weekly. Uh, and Regularly, you're not the first yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, and you're the first person who said that. So it's definitely something I'm aiming to. Oh yeah, consistency. Uh, that's yeah, that's the key to growth yes. online is yeah. is consistency. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So kind of what my question is is um, when you kind of hit those unavoidable setbacks, for example, your Zelda shenanigans that you just spoke about, or my daughter's home for a week sick and Ooh. I can barely turn on the computer. Uh, when I've hit those things, I sort of tend to obviously fall off the grid and kind of go dark online. And that's fair. Yeah, and uh, just wondering, just like advice you have on just trying to sort of keep ahead and making sure you always have something that you can consistently release or at least keep your online presence, uh, your presence online for when um, those setbacks hit. You know, recently, this year in particular, I have become a lot less, um, I care a lot less about social media uh, uh, liveliness. And um, I care a lot more about, um, the frequency and quality of the musical output. Um, I think Spotify in a way has kind of saved us from having like the Twitter and Instagram grind because you don't have to have a lit Twitter or Instagram to have your music do really, really well on Spotify. If you're releasing consistently and you're, and you're uh, framing up your music in a way that is easy for people to listen to and that people want to listen to. Um, I would say the best policy um, is to try to make a small step in the right direction every day even if it's like going on splice for five minutes and finding a new kick loop or like, you know, cleaning your keyboard or something like that. Like I actually find a lot of value in that mundane shit when it's really stressful. Like even doing the dishes, I saw an adorable little depression comic on my Instagram feed of like, I didn't do anything today, but I did do the dishes and it's better than yesterday or some, I'm pair. It was very cute. You got to believe me. Um, but it's a really good message because if you can just do a tiny little step, then you're, you're ahead, you're ahead. And so, and sometimes, you know, you got to grind for 14 hours a day for two weeks, like Zelda and chill too. But, um, if you're just thinking about long-term your career, you're not and think about the big picture, you as an artist or as a musician or a producer, wherever you see yourself, as long as you're making moves in the right direction every day, you'll outpace the people around you that, that aren't doing that. And um, it's about momentum. You know, like if you look at what Game Chops and DJ Cutman together have going for them right now, it's like numerically, statistically, it's completely insane to me. Like it's totally bonkers. Like Game Chops is almost a million individual people last month on Spotify. And that like blows my freaking mind. I don't know a million people. I don't even, I don't even know if I have a dozen friends, but uh, that's an F, that's a, that's a testament to the fact that I just have been doing this shit for long enough. And I, and I just try to do it every single day, I guess 10 years. And I would say of this 10 years, I maybe have taken 20 days off entirely, you know, like deliberately. And sometimes you don't get anything done, you know, but if you have this like internal, and I don't know about you guys, but I definitely have this internal um, need to feel productive and do something that, taking the moment of when you have that, the headspace to think about what is it I'm really trying to do? Which piece am I trying to move on the board? What is really important to me? Um, for me right now, learn how to play piano. Like I learn how to read a sheet because I don't know how to do that stuff. And the people I know who do, it just looks like the coolest thing in the world to me. So that, so I'm doing everything in my power to sit down at the piano for 20 minutes, first thing in the morning 
And if I do that, then hooray. And if I spend the entire day trying to make a beat and nothing is good, that's fine. If I found that one thing I was able to pull off, 20 minutes in the piano or whatever it is, um, the day's not a waste, you know? So you got your daughter home sick or the world's on fire and everything's crazy or, you know, uh, the internet goes out, the worst case of them all, you know? Um, if you could find one thing to do uh, that, that, that supports your mission, uh, then I then I think that you'll you'll feel all right in the long run. I mean, that's been what I've been doing, and it's been it helps. And you know, I, I lost my mom this year um, in October, and um, that was the month that we did all the Zelda Chill Two production. And um, I was going through the uh, the darkest time of my life, but I knew I felt like I had a responsibility to my collaborators because I really do appreciate the artists that work with me on Game Chops. So, like genuinely, as people, like I try to take care of everyone. So I knew I had obligations to other people, but then I also knew that that's the work that really matters to me, like mastering video game lo-fi beats. Like I would do that for the rest of my life. It's just, I just love it. I just love it. So having work that I really appreciate and knowing that every day I got to just be doing something, even if just listening to a mix one more time, just put it in my headphones and listen to it five times while I'm going to get the groceries or something. You're that much, you're, you're ready for when you get the opportunity, when you get the time, when something opens up and all of a sudden you're like, holy shit, I have the whole weekend with nothing to do. If you've been taking little steps every day, all those little steps you don't have to do when you finally get a big stretch of time. Because you get a day and you think, oh yeah, I'm going to do everything. But if you decide, I'm going to plug in my new synth first, I promise you nothing else is getting done that day. You know, but if you plugged in the synth on Monday and you got the power adapter on Tuesday and you clean the keyboard on Wednesday, then when Friday rolls it down, all that stuff's in order and you can just like jam all day. So that's why any way you can build it into your daily routine, taking care of your musicianship um, and the world surrounding it. I think that it's really worthwhile because like that's how this room got built. It wasn't like planned. It was like every little chance I had, I tweaked something or something. And now it's the perfect space for me. Oh, that's great. That's really, really helpful. Um, thanks. I also just kind of wanted to follow up. One of the other things you spoke about was sort of the importance of uh, scheduling the releases. I think mm -hmm. you were saying like making sure something on Spotify comes on the Friday release radar and stuff. Oh yeah. Uh, I'll and give you guys the, um, I'll give you guys the game plan. I've been trying to do this, but every time I tweet about Spotify, somebody gets mad. So I can't, <laughs> uh, I can't deliver this information on Twitter, but, uh, um, Oh, thank you for the nice chat messages, folks. What a good, what a good community we have here. Um, what was the question? Sorry, I saw the chat and it made me happy. And uh, was, <laughs> scheduling <laughs> releases on Spotify and uh, other. Ah, yes. As well. The um, all right, gloves are coming off. Um, so Spotify updates its algorithmic playlists on Sunday. Sunday is the day your music has to like be visible on Spotify for artists for it to show up the following Friday on your uh, on release radar. Now, if you don't know what release radar is, it is the easiest playlist to get on on Spotify. It's algorithmically generated by anyone who has hit the follow button on your Spotify profile. And um, uh, you could even like make your own Spotify account if you haven't followed your artist yet, follow your own artist. And then on Friday, release radar will come out. And if you, even if you don't use Spotify at all, your artist's track will appear and then it'll just cram a bunch of stuff it thinks you might like. Um, so getting people to follow you on Spotify and then being aware that, all right, the music has to arrive on Sunday to show up the next Friday is key. Because once you understand that, you can decide, you know, I want to put out a song every week. All right, you know you have to like ship on Friday so it arrives on Sunday and the next Friday people get it. If you do ASAP releases, which DistroKid kind of pushes you to if you have the cheapest account, um, I recommend getting the second tier account, the 40 bucks one. Um, over the cheapest district kid. It, sorry, we don't need to talk about district kid plans. But the idea is you send the music to platforms with a release date in the future. So the platforms can ingest it and then send it out to people automatically. So you're not counting on um, Instagram or Twitter to get a bunch of people to click to your Spotify page. Spotify is organically doing it because it's got the songs, it's received them, you know, a week in advance, and it knows everyone who hit that follow button. So like platforms like Facebook, YouTube, we don't see everyone who you've liked or you don't see everybody you've subscribed to. Spotify still works in the way where if somebody hits that follow button, they know they want to send you everything and they have to unfollow you or like really dislike a bunch of releases in a row for that to start stop happening. 
So um, yeah, you wanna get your releases basically out a week in advance with the awareness that the algorithmic traffic on Spotify is gonna come in on a Friday. And if you say you have an album's worth of material, 10 songs or say 12 songs, you can release them every single week, every Friday have another one came out. And as long as you, as long as Spotify has it in hand the Sunday prior, you can count on some amount of automatic algorithmic plays. And you know, if you're just starting out or you haven't been cultivating an audience on Spotify, that could be like 10 plays. It could be like two plays. If it's just you and your mom, you know, following you on, on your phone. But the idea is if you're, even if just you are listening to your own music, you're giving Spotify data about who likes your music. And it's gonna look at your listening habits and compare them to other people. And over time, it's gonna start recommending music that you made. And um, I'm 10 years deep and we've got a million people on Game Chops. There's a lot of things going into that. Don't say that. I'm not trying to suggest that every brand is gonna grow that big. There's a lot of people uh, who contribute, but um, the, the principle is the same. Regularly releasing stuff um, and uh, getting it to platforms about a week early and then um, paying attention to what gets plays and what gets saves and what people like. And then this is the hard part, deciding to make music that's gonna to cater to those people or deciding to try something else. Um, so there's this like constant um, reviewing of the data. And even if the data is super minuscule, if, you, if your track usually gets 10 plays and your new one gets 30, that's like, that's something you should really focus on. And the artists that choose to, um, start doing well in my experience. Everybody I know who has been like, man, I started making lo-fi beats and people really liked them. So I made 500 of them. They're like living in a mansion now or something. Uh, but yeah, that's the, the basic thing is get the music out early. Be aware that Friday is when a release radar traffic comes in. And then, um, and then don't fall off. Don't fall off. Like it, the, really everybody who's trying to cultivate some sort of royalties from Spotify, uh, and when I say Spotify, I do mean all platforms. Uh, I just find they're the easiest to talk about and make most people use them. Um, you should be aiming to have a new release every like one to six weeks. And if you go more than six weeks, you may never get to the point where your stats go up above those 10 plays or something. But if you're doing something every other week, once a month, something like that, if you're producing stuff that that you're listening to it all the way front to back and you're happy with it and other people are doing that too, it will naturally grow because Spotify will, over time, gather data about who likes it, find more people, and send it out to them. And it's a long game for sure, but um, it seems to work. It seems to work for me and, and a lot of other artists. Does awesome. Thank question? you very much for that. Awesome. Okay, Steven, so you, got, you got a hand up. Let's keep the good times rolling. Um, and thank you for asking me because I sort of wanted to hand? Uh, piggyback off of Frederick. That's a, the Zoom hand. If you're Zoom, I never noticed. Right? I've seen the hand button, uh, the contextual menu. I've never actually noticed it before. I'm learning a lot. This is my second Zoom interview today. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that'll be a fast learning curve. But no, I wanted to go back to Spotify. So I understand pretty well how Spotify can be a great tool to get other people to listen to your music and build a following, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Financially, uh, the last I heard about Spotify was a couple of years ago from the financial aspect. But from so what I heard, it was a tiny fraction of a percent of a penny that you were getting per like thousand streams. So I, I thought oh. that even the most popular people were getting, you know, um, chicken feed. I am so happy to have the opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to debunk this ridiculous myth Thank that you. Spotify doesn't pay because Spotify pays four times more than YouTube. A thousand plays on YouTube is is a thousand plays on YouTube is like a dollar. All right. A thousand plays on Spotify is like almost four bucks. Like a thousand plays is not a lot of plays. Like you could do that yourself, except for that's against the terms of service. I said that in my panel and then somebody was like, you shouldn't do that. It's like, that's the terms of service. So I'm not suggesting you loop your own music. I'm actually, I've been told that Spotify identifies if you loop your own music and does not pay you for those plays. So don't loop your own music. But the idea of getting a thousand plays is not so crazy. Like YouTube, it's, it's, there's a lot of people on there, but Spotify's algorithm is still really favorable to good content. You know, on YouTube, I'm not trying to rag on YouTube, but like, you definitely you, not all kinds of art work in the, on that website, you know, animation famously a few years ago, a lot of animators left because the, the amount they were making per video was just not enough to cover the art of animation. And a lot of music channels 
including mine, um, struggle very hard to get, despite having tons of subs, getting a lot of views on music because the platform just, it. some people get it, some people don't. Game Chops had a nice run a few years ago, but um, our, our Zelda and Chill videos do great. Um, but like I upload a lot of videos to that channel and they like barely make 10 bucks. Like really, like I'll spend two hours rendering something and it will make like $2 a year. And um, even that's being generous. But on Spotify, yeah, it's like a premium, an account from a United States premium account, like somebody who pays the $9 a month or whatever, is um, about $4 per thousand, which is really freaking sweet. Like, yeah, you're not gonna be, able, it's not the same as someone buying an album on Bandcamp where somebody listens to two songs and then you get 10 bucks. But the idea is, or my model is based on, you know, regularly re releasing and allowing the platform to promote your music. So you're not spending hours and hours grinding. Like, I, you know, I played shows for many, many years and toured all around uh, North America. And um, that is a grind for your money. Like I've played shows where I got paid 12 bucks for three hours. And like, it's not enough for me to like go to the Burger King, you know, and get a taxi home. So um, there's a lot of ways to like grind and not make any money. And Spotify will be one of those at the start. But if you stumble onto something and, and you find listeners, and that's really the key. If like if you can find listeners for your music, either you organically find them by making music that people really like, or you figure out some way of music you enjoy that there's already a built in audience, um, then over time of regularly releasing, the platform will promote. You don't have to spend all this time grinding, selling merch or whatever. Um, if you're able to support yourself some other way and then a year down the road, you could have a a real foundation of a career that in my experience, like a lot of the stats kind of go like this, boom, there's a big spike and then they decay, but they never get like down to the bottom. You know, it starts at the bottom, maybe like a new game shop song might get 5,000 plays on Friday. So a huge spike. And then over the weekend, it always dips. And then Monday comes around, it comes back up because a lot of people listen during work and then it tails down for a month. And then at the end of the month, there's like something that I've been calling the floor which is a certain amount of plays that song will get per day based on you know who's liked it, who's listening to it in their library or the random Spotify radio that's promoting it. And, um, and once you figure out what that floor is, say, um, you know, I just was looking at a DJ Cutman song earlier today where the floor was 70 plays. I think it was my song Coral Reef, which underrated song I think is really, I really am happy with that one. Um, but so Coral Reef gets 70 plays a day. Um, that's not a lot of plays, but we can do the math and say, you know, how long does it take to get to a thousand plays and make those four bucks? Or we don't even need, we need 250 plays to make a dollar. So what's that? Five days, about. So like once a week, that song's making me a dollar. That doesn't sound like a lot when someone's mad on Twitter about it, but think about that, that's $365 a year, or uh, nope, nope, that's $50 a year, 52 weeks a year. Um, and $50 a year is not a lot, but then, you know, what if you have 10 of them? It's 500 bucks a year, you know? And then all of a sudden you see, ah, if you release in a song every other week, you know, that's 26 new songs every year. If they're all making a dollar a week, there's now you're making 26 bucks a week. And you're doing it with this idea of like all these songs having a floor. Um, you're doing it for the long haul. So like, yeah, slowly, if you stop releasing music, those floors would probably come down to zero. But as long as you continue putting data into the algorithm spotify can find more listeners to you and that you've uh, put out music that you think is good and people are listening to um the idea is over time you get a catalog that even if nothing blows up you're earning you know a reasonable amount of money a part-time salary or uh, enough to buy new gear or just enough to you know get a pizza one night um and it all stems from that original concept of just like putting out songs regularly and then um building a catalog of music that you think is, is worth listening to. Thank you. This is really insightful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah That's math. awesome. Dude, I would talk about this stuff all the time. You want me to come back again? I absolutely will. Um, I feel like this is usually the stuff I've been talking for 45 minutes about cover song licensing and Spotify algorithms. That's usually when like people start walking away from me at the party. <laughs> so I'm really having a good time here. <laughs> We're a different kind of party, I think. Yeah. This is where the, is where the real party's at. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's it. Of course. That's it. You found you found the right party, finally. Um <laughs> 
Yeah, no, this is this is great. And I think that like breaking down the math of that incremental income is like huge. Um, and we should definitely dig into that some other time, like super deep. But I don't want to, I've got like 10 questions I want to ask, but I'm going to let just, you know, ask his question because it's not about me tonight. Just, you know, go for it, dude. If you can safely. <laughs> muted. You're muted though, bud. Hold on. Uh... Oh, he was unmuted for a second. There you go. Wait. I'm unmuted now? Yeah, you're good. Okay, so here's my question. Sorry, I'm working right now, so I'm in my car, but this is great. Um, thank you for being here. Now, the question that I have is, you talked about putting out good music. Yeah. So where do you, as an artist, define your voice and your music versus putting out something that needs to be listened to so people are buying your music? Where's that balance between, between that of success and artistic integrity all right that's a great question and i've been thinking about that a lot um and i think i have an answer that's like kind of technical in nature but will probably make a lot of sense to you guys um i make whatever i want to make and i do not think about um what i ought to be making i just like make my music i make my tracks that i want to hear and i make the decision about it being marketable or, or however you want to say the professionalism that is almost entirely in the arrangement of the song. I'll say that again, like I make whatever I want musically. And then once that's done and I've made my art, I cut it, cut man, get it? I cut it to fit an arrangement I think people are gonna listen to the whole thing. So I've made, like I, I have a song with Glitch City, uh, How Holy City from Pokemon. It is a five and a half minute song. Um, we have released two versions of it and both of them together are not actually the whole arrangement that I did. I actually am finally releasing the extended uh, uh, version of that song at the, as the very last track on my album because uh, I don't care anymore. <laughs> but basically, um, long intros are murder, total murder. And, um, and if you have a minute of your song like quiet at the beginning, like people will just skip it. And Spotify sees that as a really, really strong sign. So if you've been listening to my music, over the years, you probably noticed my songs are getting a little shorter and um, I'm, they're getting right to the point. I like don't do, I used to do really long epic intros and I like don't anymore because um, I noticed on the stats that when I got to the point faster, it was getting more playlists, it was getting more likes, it was getting more plays. And for me as an artist, I'm okay trimming the fat. Like I'm okay not having a long intro um, because I know if I'm gonna DJ this song, if I'm gonna perform this song, the audience is gonna sit through that minute and a half intro if it's my show, but Spotify is not my show. Spotify is an app that we have on our phones to listen to music when we're, when we're working, when we're, you know, sleeping, when we're doing the dishes or whatever. And I think that that is something that a lot of people miss um, because you can be your pure unfiltered artist and you can do whatever you want. But if you're trying to do this at some level of professionalism, there's gotta be a point where you say, all right, I want to make money with this art I've made. What do I need to do to make that easy? And the answer I've found in these past few years is cut the arrangement so that there's no bullshit in front of it. Dave Grohl, don't bore us, get to the chorus, you know? And um, like I said, I make whatever I want. Coral Reef, I think that's the best song I've ever done. It's getting 70 plays a day and not, not a hit. But I'm happy because I put out a song I like and I and I, I arrange it in such a way that it's it's still getting 70 plays a day and I'm happy with that. And so I'll move on to the next one. So yeah, that's my that's my thoughts on that. That's great. I um, appreciate that answer. Um, that's always something that I find as an artist, like people really like this track. Do I keep composing in this style or do I compose how I like? I so, think you compose yeah. how you like. That's what I'm, yeah. my vote is you compose how you like, but you look at that song and you take whatever you can. You ask yourself, why do people like this song? I bet it's got a good arrangement. I bet, I don't even know, I don't even know your artist's name or your track, but I bet if you have one song that's doing better, it is, it is probably a song that gets to the point right away, if it's on Spotify anyway. Yeah. But yeah, I would take a look at that song and, and see what you can glean from it. But then I don't I don't make compromises. I like don't I don't know any artist actually, frankly, that makes shit they don't like to appease people. Like I've been hearing about bands selling out, you know, since I was in middle school, but like I just never met anyone who actually has done that. So uh -huh. 
Yeah, I just maybe there maybe there are people out there, but uh, for me, I make whatever I want, and then when it's done, I feel like I've creatively expressed myself, and then it gets on the chopping block, and I try to you know get some pizza money out of it. I I want to make a, a connection actually because I think that, and and I've I've talked and thought about this with a lot of different people as well, and I think there's the, a really interesting connection is between your point about consistency. Mm -hmm. and like basically just prolifically creating and doing what you like and what you're passionate about because if you can't be prolific and keep creating shit that you don't like you're just gonna yeah. it's just not gonna work you'll just burn out you won't be consistent you'll find reasons not to i mean that's... yeah absolutely i i say if you have a song that i mean dude for like years and years and years the top dj command song was boat dog do you guys know that song Boat Dog. It's a remix of Markiplier saying Boat Dog. And I just like put a bunch of splice <laughs> loops. I had the flu. I had the flu when I made this beat and I was like, I'm so sick. I'm going to make a beat that's so sick. And then I made this beat in like three hours with like a head cold medicine in me. And I uploaded it to Spotify like as a troll. And like up until six months ago, you say, hey, Alexa, play DJ Cutman. It would play Boat Dog full volume, like clipping splice loops. And, uh, but the song, like, I mean, the song did really well and people clearly like it, but yeah, I mean, it happens. It happens that you make something and, um, people love it and you don't. And frankly, I'll tell you something, at least in my experience, the stuff that is my absolute favorite, like Coral Reef is not the hits. It's not what people remember. It's not what people tell me about. It's not what gets a lot of plays, but I got to make it. So I'm feeling good about myself. And I have some songs that are silly, that are fun, that are reverent, that, bring in more money. And you know, that's part of the gig. You're not, everything's going to be the winner, but if you are enjoying the process and if you're happy with the music, then, you know, put it out and, and just keep on, keep on rolling. That's what I've been doing anyway. Awesome. Carol's got the hand up. Hit it. Sorry. I was waiting uh, if anybody else will raise the hand. So I, I, I didn't see any, so I raised it. Not trying to be an ass. Uh, anyways, um, my question is, sorry, beep. Right, it was supposed to be a peep. Um, You're good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, so my question is, uh, since you're producing trucks as well, right? Um, I don't know what software you use, like Logic or Cubase. Uh, I use Ableton uh, to I produce, am... and I use Pro Tools to master. Okay. Okay. So my question is, uh, do you have any specific master chain? So, for example, your mastering, ch uh, your master I... chain of the plugins, and the I... second question. Uh, it's like part of the same question. Um, do you use um, the mastering meters like uh, LUFS, like the uh, Yulian yes. meter, for example, just because for different platform, you need different uh, LUF uh, loudness units. <laughs> level. Yeah, so um, the, my general takeaway on loudness is it doesn't matter anymore about making your music competitively loud. You should just make sure your limiter is doing some work. And I range between eight at the loudest side and 14 luffs for loudness really like if you hit 12 luffs like it's great so platforms like spotify and youtube are normalizing now so you don't even really have to like worry about getting your tracks really loud um it doesn't look like i can share my screen i literally have pro tools mastering session open right now you can totally share your screen i what promise do i have to do to do it mute my stop video there's there's a there's a green arrow that says share screen what happens when you push it where is that oh the big green button at the bottom okay. the one that's yeah the, yep, Multiple. That's the one. all right let me try Okay. Oh, I you got this. And then if tabs. you got audio, make sure, hold on before you, oh, you sorry, too late. Hopefully you, you saw there's an audio check. Uh, there's a checkbox at the bottom when you like are selecting which screen you're going to share to share your, your computer audio. So if you didn't check that box, we won't be able to hear anything. You're not going to so be able know. to hear things anyway, because it's running through an interface and zoom doesn't, isn't going to have access to it, but I can show you the chain. How about that? You could Perfect. hear me still and see me and, and yes. Okay. We can. Um, I can play the music for you when I have access to the audio devices. But let me show you. I'm doing this um, wonderful Christmas video game album with T. Lopes, where he has taken public domain Christmas songs and mashed them up with the melodies from video games. Uh, this one is called Carol of the Lost Woods. And I'll play it. You'll hear it through my mic, probably. Um, but I'll just quickly go through the plugins and explain what's going on. Uh, the first thing I have here is a subtractive EQ. Just getting rid of any kind of stuff we didn't want. Since this was lo-fi, I just rolled off 18K and above. Then I have my favorite SSL compressor, 
bus compression, just sort of gluing the whole track together. I really love the sound of this thing. It's been on DJ Cutman Beats since the beginning, and I still use it all the time. Um, slow attack, fast release, and a two to one ratio. Next up, uh, Fab Filter Pro Multiband, more sort of shaping of the track. Um, it's a multiband compressor. It's not that exciting, but it's nice and it does the job. Next is my secret sauce. This is the SSL EQ by Waves. And I love this for lo-fi because I can just turn down the high end super easily with one knob and then it's super lo-fi. So... Well, that actually sounds good. That's why I like this EQ is because you can get kind of meaty with it and it uh, it really has a nice sound. Um, then I'm for harmonics, I'm putting the Abbey Road vinyl plugin on it, which I've just started doing with lo-fi. Um, I don't use the crackle because the producers often put this stuff in, but it's got a little bit of noise. It sounds like a lacquer on the Abbey Road turntable, which is just like really nice. I turned off the wow stuff because it's gross, but it just basically kind of makes the track even more like glued together. And then to top it all off, we have the Fab Filter Pro L2, which is the most versatile limiter. I almost always use it because it's nice. Um, it has a great display and you can see if I drop in where the beat is. We are, this is short term luffs, but you'll see we're around 12 luffs in loudness. So this is a very simple master chain one more time. It's subtractive EQ, bus compression, multiband, color EQ, I like to call it, harmonics, and then master limiter. So it's not really, and you could, you could do a portion of this chain with like not all these things. Like multiband sometimes isn't even needed. Um, same with bus compression if you're doing something in your mix. Um, you certainly don't need this thing, but I've just been liking it lately because I think it gives me the kicks sound really like juicy. I don't know if that makes sense, but I like this. It gives me the juicy kicks I need. And then you do need a good limiter. So if you bought one plugin in your whole damn life, it should probably be this because um, putting Pro L on the top, making sure you have a nice clean render, it's going to sound better on Spotify. And one nice thing that I like to give all producers is set your output to negative one. If you've been doing this for a long time, you might think that negative 0.1 is what I mean, or negative 0.3, which are like negative 0.3 was like early 2000s, negative 0.1 was like 2010s. But nowadays with the music getting so, just so compressed everywhere and not like compressed sounding, but like you send out your master from DistroKid, that goes to Spotify, which gets encoded into a high encoded stream for premium people and a low one for other users. You put it on YouTube and it gets converted into like every single bit rate has a different audio sample. Um, you upload it to Twitter or Instagram and it gets completely destroyed every single time, every song I do. Um, but and by putting your output at negative one, you basically just allow your building in room for the platforms to ruin your song without actually ruining your song. If you had your output at zero, zero, you may have noticed, oh, it sounds great in my DAW and then I upload it to SoundCloud and it sounds like trash. And that's all you need to do is bring down your total output level. And then if you bring in your waveform into like your DAW or a DJ software or whatever, you'll see that the brick of loudness will not like be all the way at the top. There'll be like a little bit of headroom and that will just, that just sort of helps it sound more consistent overall which for mastering, I really think the key thing is making sure the track translates, that it sounds good in a, coming out of a phone or it sounds good coming out of a big PA system and it sounds good coming out of your headphones and all that stuff. And one really easy way to do that is just like give yourself negative one on whatever master limiter you're using. And then when it gets compressed in its life, um, there'll be a little extra headroom built in. And you're not really gonna lose any noticeable loudness this way either. Not that that even matters anymore. All right, you guys got my lo-fi master chain. This is this I've been building this chain for like three years. I know it seemed like only six plugins, but they're really all doing a lot of work. And it's in a really, really great form now. Like it really delivers. Zelda Chill 2 went through this chain. Super Lo-Fi World 2 went through this chain. Now the T Lopes Christmas album is going through. And it's really just about like treating the stuff that we couldn't handle in the mix with EQ, compressing it, compressing it more, doing a little bit of EQ to just sort of make it really shine in the right places and then doing something nice to the top end so the file comes out good, you know? And uh, yeah, that's the, that's the chain. Thanks for coming to my tutorial. I really feel like I should sign off a YouTube video after going through all that. <laughs> uh, was there anything that I didn't like cover clearly in there? Any, any questions about any of those particular plugins? It's a big rabbit hole of things I just opened up, but uh, 
Oh yeah, here look, there's the Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thank. Stephen saying thanks for coming to my TED talk is right. The sign off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, TED talks. Oh boy, I could talk about those. Um, so, first of all, I just wanted to say thanks. This has been awesome. Um, we got about four minutes left. Sure. Um, so if we, if anyone has like one lingering question left, I, you know, now's the time. I also want to make sure that Chris, you have a moment. You've got so many like, uh, you know, irons in the fire. I want you to like, tell us oh, yeah. what's going on and I can, I can plug stuff, right? Yeah, do all it, right. do it, man. Um, all right, let's do the plug and then we'll take a question with whatever we have. So the thing that I would like y'all to support the most, um, is the Zelda and shell two vinyl. If you like records, you have a record collection or you collect VGM vinyl, um, please do back the campaign. It's only $25 and it's the cheapest it'll ever be. Um, it's a heavyweight analog, complete analog mastering chain from a guy out in California um, who does great work. It's a heavyweight, full length uh, colored vinyl and it's just super good. Um, not that I need you guys, you guys probably should be spending your money on DistroKid accounts, but if you do like vinyl or you know anybody who does, um, I, I'm super happy that I'm able to like publish my own vinyl through Bandcamp now. It's super duper exciting. And if you don't already follow Game Chops, I'm putting the Game Chops smart URL into the chat and I'll put the DJ Cutman smart URL into the chat too. Really, frankly, you guys don't have to buy anything from me, um, but if you would follow me on whatever music platform you like, if it's Spotify or something else, if you don't already follow Game Chops or DJ Cutman, um, go ahead and hit that follow button and, and you'll get our new songs on release radar and you can tell me what you think on Twitter and an angry screed if you must. <laughs> <laughs> I could also say, say for sure that the, you know, your, your music is fantastic for any time when you need to get something done that is not making music. Like it is great. Put your nose to the grindstone music. And for me, I know like, I have super sh like I have like diagnosed ADD. I'm not just like saying that as a catchphrase. Oh, I've got that, like, oh, a that... lot of people. A lot of people just like throw they like, oh, I have trouble focusing sometimes. It must be you know I've got I must have ADD. Like a lot of people like just say it. Um, it's like a very kitschy thing to say. Oh no, um, I've I lived know. my whole life this way, and it's, yep. well, at least it's cool now, right? It's super. Yeah, we're <laughs> we're yeah, we're at the top of we're at the top of the uh, the pile finally. Um, <laughs> Um, and it only would help the chaos in our brains to be that cool. Um, well, you know, so I, I, uh, not to cut you off, but I do want to say that I, my ADD is way tempered when music is playing. And that's exactly where songs, I was going with this. Exactly. Well, a lot of these songs I, 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 uh, I have made with that intention, not with that intention, but with that like direction, like while this beats on, I'm actually working on music and I'll just keep this beat going. You know, one of the beautiful things about Ableton is you can make a very small loop in a small amount of time and keep it running while you produce. And mm -hmm. um, that's how a lot of my early work got done when I didn't have the confidence to like no structure or whatever. I'm just going to keep it looping for as many hours as it takes. Um, so yes, thanks for listening. And you know, Zelda and Chill Two, check it out wherever you uh, wherever you listen to music because it's. I think it's. I really think it's like one of the best sounding albums uh, I've ever worked on. So yeah, awesome. whether on vinyl or digital, I think I'm really happy with how it turned out. Love it. Well, I'll, I know I'll definitely share the hell out of that. So uh, this is, uh, you want to say hi, hi, buddy. This is my, my little minion is, is here. Oh, hello. Up. Um, so I think this is, is this his first zoom appearance? I think this is, he finally, he finally broke in. Um, must have snuck back to security. So, uh, Are you guys talking about Ableton? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want to say hi? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Excellent. Um, cool. So, well, uh, Chris, thanks so much for spending an hour with us here today. You don't have to get into this camera. Don't worry. They can see you. See? Right oh. there. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to share the recording later on with folks. And, um, you know, folks, don't be a stranger. You know, follow and, and uh, you know, just check it out. Oh, yes. I'm, a, I'm video game DJ on Twitter and Instagram, and I do check my messages. So if you have questions or, or thoughts about this kind of stuff, um, yeah. send me a mention on Twitter or a DM on Instagram uh, at video game DJ. And that's me. And I and I check those things. Oh, and we have super lo-fi world shirts. Yes. I'll put the link in the chat, too. Oh, man, I have products. This is unusual. Do it, yeah. I'm not push used that, to Push that merch. Teespring that super low and yeah, there's Teespring. a big game chops logo on the back i think right is it there it is there it is there <laughs> yep 
<laughs> awesome. All right, folks. Well, I will uh, share this recording as soon as it's available uh, yeah. after tonight. And thank you. I'm not going to eat the microphone. Um, and uh, I look, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I will uh, see you all for the next one. Thanks again, Chris. Uh, and feel free to unmute and say goodbye, folks, or, or uh, you know, whatever you'd like to say on your way out. And you, you know, <laughs> safe drive. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm safe, drive. <laughs> safe drive. Hey, thanks, Dan. This was really fun. Uh, I appreciate you all coming out, and I hope that this was informative or helpful in some way. It absolutely was. Thank you, Chris, for yeah. being here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, all right, folks. Thanks for doing this. this. is really great. All right, I'm gonna sign off and I will upload this as soon as it's available. And Chris, I'll share the link with you as well so that uh, we can just get it get it everywhere. Yeah. Later, yeah. folks. Yeah, all right, I'll keep an eye on it. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>